afternoon. You've joined Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. We're here to talk about uh, systems control light rail on Likeable Science. With me today in the studio is uh, Tom Eichhorn, a project control engineer from uh, Ansaldo, uh, Ansaldo, excuse me. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a, a fun, wide ranging discussion, I hope, about the uh, systems thinking in general, why we, why we use systems thinking, and really how this applies, how it makes sense and, and plays out in, in the real world. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Ethan. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you for coming here. So Tom has been in the uh, uh, transit industry for about 40 years, I guess. He uh, graduated from Clarkson University and did postgraduate work at Rochester Institute of Technology. He's a member of uh, IEEE, the Institute for Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and has been in working groups uh, in the, the, for best practices in the transit industry in that, in that organization. And uh, currently is working here on, on Honolulu's new, new light rail system. So before we get into the, the specifics of light rail, I thought it would probably be good to establish a little common ground, be sure we're, we're talking about the same stuff and that uh, our audience uh, all understands this too, uh, about what we mean by systems, what are systems, why do we think about systems, and all that kind of stuff. So you and I have rather different backgrounds. I'm, I'm a biologist by training and, and you're an engineer, and so I tend to think of systems in biological terms, like a human system, a human being is a system. We have skeletal systems and muscular systems and digestive systems and respiratory systems and all, whereas you might think of other systems. Yeah, so, so I generally think of systems as um, uh, composites of subsystems, components that make up those subsystems, and then you know, they're, they're, they're aimed at doing some sort of task or some sort of goal or some sort of challenge. And then w uh, we as engineers break those, um, those, the, the main goal down into manageable tasks that we can um, define subsystems to actually achieve those minor goals and eventually build it back up to achieve the original goal. So yeah, so I, I think of systems as as transit systems, as as computer systems, as networks, as those kinds of things that that people and engineers and you know, that build and consumers use as in everyday life. Exactly, and, but they all have whether we're talking sort of biological or engineering, they all have this idea of having these components that all interact yeah. and components that link in some way into the functionality of the system, and mm -hmm. the system ultimately. The system function depends upon these component interactions. Yeah, and as you look at as you look at systems and you decompose them into subsystems, you know there, there's from my perspective, you can decompose systems into subsystems into subsystems into subsystems and never end. And each one of those subsystems is made up of other subsystems and other components. And in my world, people have to build each of those components up into those into those building blocks to create a, an overall control system. Okay. Exactly, and it's very much this, the same in biological systems where mm -hmm. you know, your systems are in themselves built of tissues and those tissues are built of cells and those cells are built of little subcellular systems within them. So mm -hmm. it, it all, there is a great deal of, of uh, similarity there. <coughs> and the idea of uh, uh, systems control gets to be an interesting one because Systems are, as you say, pervasive, uh, and can, every system has more more systems within it, and every system typically is part of still bigger systems. Mm -hmm. So systems cover sort of the gamut from subatomic particles to galaxies and everything in between. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and you can look at anything as being a system. Right. I mean, as that, long that's as that's the beauty of it. Yeah, and it's it's a, it's a good way, I think, to help people understand the connectivity of the world, right, and the fact that typically, you know, sort of what you do over here is ultimately going to impact what happens over here exactly. in, in some system, way. Every, every system, you, you know, you, you have a little response over here and it's going to ripple through and have a different response for the overall system. It may be desirable, may not be desirable for what you're trying to achieve on it. And, and so in control systems, we have to take all those things into account and, and plan for them and uh, go over all the what ifs, how this thing fails, how that thing fails. And, and make sure that the overall system t still achieves what we're trying to do with it. Exactly, exactly. That's, so systems, in a sense, are very much fed by information then. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's, yeah. it's this feedback loops of, of information from 
component A going to component B and component B going to component C and Right. So each one of these components and each one of these subsystems need to be, well, in, in my world anyway, need to be stable. And, and, and they can easily, based on different triggers or different events, become unstable. So there's got to be some sort of feedback loop that allows them to come back into stability again. Or else one little component goes out, you know, becomes unstable, that creates that subsystem to be unstable, and you could have a ripple effect where the whole thing becomes unstable. Now there are some systems that that's their goal, right. you know, to chain reactions of, of 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 things, and sometimes people build these things to have a different goal than than any of our systems. But you know, the the, the out of control thing could be a, a goal all to itself. All right. of ours are built on being stable and and coming back into control. Right. So again, to, to take it back into my realm of biology. Mm -hmm. We have homeostasis, for instance, we keep our body temperature mm -hmm. constant, and if mm -hmm. you get too hot, you start to sweat, if you get too cold, you start to shiver, these are our feedback loops. But then, for instance, the process of giving birth is a classic, sort of a positive feedback loop that, you know, there's, there is a point where you want that system to just go and yeah. br break up into subsystems, exactly. as it were. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's a, none of my systems do that, but <laughs> that's one big difference. Uh, that, that's true, that's true. So this idea of control, of course, varies a good deal from sort of what you call mindless control, that is in, say, in atoms, the, 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 the various subatomic forces that hold an atom together mm -hmm. uh, with, within its tight bounds are, are sort of mindless control systems up to control systems that have to be watching very closely and have to have a lot of information feeding back and forth, mm -hmm. such as ones where you, you yeah, you're dealing so with. so we we always have we, and and most of our our systems are closed loop systems, meaning that whatever re response a subsystem has, the overall system responds to that and and reacts in a in a controlled manner. Um, but but everything has its feedback. So if you're if in, in transit or in even driving your car, if you're over speed, you know you take your foot off the accelerator and put on the brake, and that's a, that in itself is a is a control mechanism and, and a feedback. And you see the speedometer go down, and you say, okay, now I'm back within the speed limit. And I go back up, but uh, potentially to pass somebody, and and all those things is a, is a system all to itself. The human's part of that, and the response, and you get feedback from the the accelerate or the the speedometer. You get feedback from being put back in your seat a little bit or pulled back on, or you know if you decelerate quickly into this into the safety belt so all those are feedback to the to the control system in in that example the person's the control system absolutely but also the car is the control system so you put your foot on the brake and something else has to happen and and that, so that's a, a really a closed loop um, control system where the person wants to decelerate and does something and the the other subsystem, in this case is a car, brakes get applied and then it starts slowing down until you achieve what you're trying to do. Maybe you're trying to get down to a speed limit that, that you know, because of a school coming up or something. Right, so there, there are, are these multiple levels of, of whole systems with their own controls buried mm -hmm. inside other systems that have their own controls absolutely. buried inside still higher level systems. Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. So they're, they're, they're all, and in my world, it, all of those have to be designed. And, and we we use from we, we borrow from previous designs because you know for transit systems they all pretty much do the same thing they all have different features and functions but the core functionality or the fundamentals really don't change you're trying to you're trying to keep um, trains safely separated and at speed um, in that in that example all, all the other systems have their own major goals you know like you said for the human is trying to regulate body temperature. Um, there's, there's many examples of, of how that works and you know how it's really achieved. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The, this uh, uh, and to, to work on that control, of course, you need to, you really do need to think of all the different components, right? You cannot. That is, it would make no sense for you to think of. Well, I just deal with the trains. I don't care about the tracks or, or the riders, right? right? I mean, all those are. The tracks well, they're all are, definitely are, interrelated. Yes, yeah, right, I mean, right. it's, it's all a. It's all part of the control system. It's all a part of, if, if you want a different term, it's all part of the environment. Okay. And, and, and the environment could be the environment for the riders, the environment for the city, the mm -hmm. environment for the state, or, the, or, or have nothing to do with that and just really be the environment. You know, it, it, it does introduce um, uh, temp temperature differentials into the environment. It introduces noise. It introduces ease of transportation, so it's going to change 
the environment around the railway. So there, mm -hmm. you know, environment's one of those words that it's like a system. You can you can make it be anything you really want it to be. Sure, sure. That can that can get get into a very high level. Uh, sure. In, in yeah, effects, yeah. But that's that's how you that's how you you can navigate or or escalate through. You know the systems thinking. Once what, once you think you you know everything about a system, you realize that that's just a component of yet another system. Right. And that that could be just another component of yet a bigger system. All right. And it's one reason that I think the whole control issue is so uh, sort of subtle and tricky because you've got to think about all the different levels where exactly. for the for the control for each each subsystem, what, what could possibly go wrong at, at any given stage. Exactly. So so in 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 our industry, we always um, we have this uh, uh, concept, or it's a, it's a, it's really not a concept. It's a fundamental of fail safeness. So, we the the safety systems. We know every every potential failure state of that piece of equipment, or that device, or that subsystem, and we have to. It has to be self-revealing. It has to be detectable. It has to be controllable, and self-mitigating. So. So any of those, all those concepts go into a, a safety system. Um, and that's one of the more unique things about um, railway systems. Um, it's mo one of the more challenging things as well. So we try to keep those safety systems as simple as possible. Because when you think you know any, any sort of little subsystem, if, once you start looking at all the potential or possible failure modes, it, it goes it becomes astronomical very quickly so we try to keep those si systems very simple so we can cover all those things um, so there and there's different technologies that we use to do that but um, it, it's it's still it still can be related to medicine you know people take medicine to have some sort of benefit right. well certain people are allergic to certain medicines so it may give you a good benefit but it also may give you a bad benefit Right. So you know that to me that might be a failure condition that you that you need to take into account. Right, and I think it's uh, one reason uh, I think medicine isn't maybe in some sense as um, predictable as engineering it is. We have it, we deal with these much more complex systems of our, our, our human physiologies where mm -hmm. we all have different metabolisms, different sensitivities, different right. allergies. Right. Right. So. So uh, so we right. are our sense a, a right. system all to ourselves that. You know, we introduce stimuli or some sort of event that triggers some other sort of event. You know, some some on purpose by taking medicine, some mm -hmm. some not on purpose, like getting stung by a bee or something right. like that, and and then you have another reaction to that. Right. So you know, there's there there are all these um, intertwinings or interrelationships of of how things react to other things. Right, and and is that that. Interplay that, that's so that's really so critical that, that makes right. Keeps some, some of it's right. controllable right. and some <laughs> of it is definitely not controllable. Right, right, and and yes, your your job then is sort of to control as much of that as possible to Absolutely. to think about all things that can't be controlled and figure out how to deal with those. Exactly. Yeah. So we, I mean, the the simplistic things is the the control system has to be stable, has to be predictable. Some of them have to be fail safe. Some of them are not fail safe. Um, but the, the fail-safe ones, we, we absolutely have to keep as simple as possible. But when I say that, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, like a tinker toy. No, no. You know, they're, they're very complex all to themselves, but we're, we, we really strive to keep them as simple as possible, but still do their, their end goal. And, right. and as time evolves and systems uh, become bigger and bigger, those simple systems become complex. Yes, yeah, and that's a, a continuing challenge. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely challenge. Indeed, indeed. Um, so, and systems, I mean, we, we can look at that also from uh, other perspectives, that is sort of historically systems uh, live, they, they go on for some period of time, they, they change over time, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, ecosystems evolve, human societies rise and fall. Of course. So yeah, course. Uh, and again, all, all with varying degrees of control in there and, and varying, varying sort of Pur purposeful versus accidental control, as it were. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, so, so animals evolve. You know, the survival of the fittest and, a, mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. Um, and, and that's that's similar to what we we have in a design concept. So, so designs that are stable and, and good five years ago tend to be still good today. Some that are are twenty years old, forty years old, are still good today. Some have mutated and disappeared. 
Right. And so, you know, there, there's very, a lot of parallels there to, to how animals evolve or how plants evolve exactly. to deal with their environment. Right, exactly. Cockroaches, widely, <laughs> widely disliked by people, are a wonderfully stable design. There are, oh, yeah. th there are fossil cockroaches that have been, are basically indistinguishable from today's bugs that were around when the Appalachian Mountains were, were rising and growing. And remember, the Appalachians were taller than the Rockies at one point. At so one it's, point. It's been a long, long time. They watched, you know, they watched sort of the dinosaurs come and go, and <laughs> all with basically the same design. You know? <laughs> They're, they're truly, truly remarkable. No matter what we do. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. So, um, let's see, what, what were we were talking about. Um, so, the idea of, of this, uh, of limits on systems then, we, we have to think as you design a system, what mm -hmm. sort of, where you want it to operate and sort of how far away from that ideal you're, you're gonna allow it to go, right? right. So in your trains, I mean, how they may be, op you may wish them to operate at 50 miles an hour. They mm -hmm. probably can go fine at 55. Mm -hmm. If they're going at 75 or 90, that's probably going to get to be yeah, that's problematic. A problem. <laughs> that's a problem for, actually, right. it's only a problem if your limit is, is 55. Right, right. If, you're, if your limit is 95 or, right. or 256, you know, then, right. you know, you've got other things to deal with. But, but those limits are, are the base limits that, or the goals that the the original design is supposed to support, so that's one of the differences between like the, the the ecosystems and the human body and those kind of things. There's no real that we know of anyway, no real design that it's trying to achieve. But the the systems that that get designed, they have goals, they have limits or constraints, and we call them design constraints that limit the 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 scope of the project or the scope of the design. And uh, sometimes it's the complexity of the design. Sometimes you know they all have to be maintainable, and you have to build those kind of things into the systems. So there, there's all kinds of all facets facets of of designs uh, requirements that get melded together to say, okay, this is the design of the overall system. So you you try to you try to put bounds on it. You have to describe every requirement, and it gets at at times very tedious and and mundane work, but, but it's really, you know, the devil's in the detail. So if you mess up at, and, on the requirements level, it can easily um, you know, escalate into a real issue you know, several years from now that you have to still deal with, but you have to go back to the original requirements and modify them and build it back up and say, okay, I'm going to make this change. What's that going to have on the overall effect of the system? Yeah, yeah. And so those are those are pretty routine things that that we deal with in in transit designs and any any subsystem designs that that people have to build. Right. As opposed to what gets what evolves all by itself. Right. Although there are sort of parallel situations in, in uh, say physiology where <clears throat> you know if one of our 22,000 25,000 genes fouls up one copy of that in, in the original DNA in a sperm or egg. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, so then that can have cascading effects. And it may, uh, and it may not be, and it right. may not be um, self-detecting for, you know, like 40 years. Right. And then all of a sudden you have this other issue that it's morphed into. Yes, exactly, and, exactly. And yeah. Some are immediately lethal, some have no effects. <laughs> yeah. Some yeah. have some delayed effect, yes. It's, exactly, it's, right. exactly. So, it, it so and, and, and so we try to keep, we, we try to look at all the, all the requirements, all the designs, we have history of what previous designs have done and how they've behaved in, in various situations and what their responses are and how well they've responded. And we make improvements to it where they go awry or, or, or aren't as, uh, you know, we have this whole concept of availability and reliability that we measure everything against. And, and so if, if a component is not very reliable, we, we design that component out of the, the system and introduce another component. And at that, it's, it's a change to the system, and we have to look at what that effective change is going to be. It's intended to be a good change, mm -hmm. and, mo and almost all the times it is, but it's going to have a reliability uh, limit. It's going to have a capabilities limit, and it could be a better capability, but that could expose some other weakness exactly. someplace else. Right. You can, so you can make things go faster. Ma but, making but things that... go faster is not always a good thing. Right, right, exactly. I mean, I always love things that go faster, <laughs> but, but making things go uh, you know, ten times faster than than what they were intended, as uh, you know, just clock cycles of, com of computers. It, it, as you expand or ex uh, make computers faster, that exposes some of the inherent um, 
uh, not really defects, but uh, uh, issues with some of the code that was written, you know, 10 years ago that, you know, no one, ex it wasn't uh, self-evident when it's going 10 times slower. When it's going 10 times faster, you know, the, the clock is really running and, and it's going to mm. come, uh, it's going to be self-evident much more often than it would have been, you know, at 10, 10 times less the speed. Sure, sure. There's, uh, you, you can really get, get your uh, uh, different, uh, what I want to say, different ages of technologies mm. can begin to have, have uh, become incompatible, basically. Yes. It, it, yeah, and, and that's, always, that's always a challenge. Um, that with, with safety systems, we always take a snapshot of technology, use it for a certain amount of time, and then take another snapshot of technology, use it because because we it, we have to get everything certified as safe as safe system. So we don't want to recertify every you know six weeks or six months or something like that. We only want to recertify when it's absolutely necessary to recertify, so we can take advantage of new technology that comes along. So while we're on the the leading edge of of technology, we're not really on the bleeding edge. You know the the, the most current stuff because or the, or the most recently developed one. We need to we want to know the history of it. We want to know how it behaves. And we want to make sure that it's it's not going to introduce something else that we don't want to have happen. Exactly. So we're going to take a little break here. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen. You're with us on Likeable Science. My guest in the studio today is Tom Eichhorn from Ensaldo. And we're talking about systems, controls, and light rail. And we'll be back and get into the whole light rail thing in just a moment. Hello, I'm Martin Despang, and I'm the host, together with the one and only Ali Amashta, and our show is called Urban Transcendence. And Urban Transcendence is about identifying where we have a unique situation of a vibrant city in one of the most beautiful natural environments. So how these two can coincide, sometimes conflict, how they could find reciprocity in the 21st century is what we're excited about. And we're planning on bringing in uh, a diverse body of, of guests, both from the arts and the science and the established and the wise and the emerging generation. So hope you will join us. We'll always be on on Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Good afternoon. You're back with Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. My guest today in the Think Tech studios is Tom Eichhorn of Ansalo Corporation and we're talking about systems, control, and light rail. We were talking before a little bit sort of in more general terms about systems and control, but I thought we should just jump right in and uh, take a look at, at the systems that you deal with the control issues on. So if we can go, get our uh, first slide up, we'll... Uh, yeah, you can go to the next one. Okay. Um, okay, so, so th this slide um, uh, shows the, the heritage or the gene genealogy of the control system for Honolulu. Um, it, it's a, a, a sister system or a system, sister project for Copenhagen that was uh, uh, put into, into service in 1992. Um, it was, I'm sorry, 2002. Um, so it's a, it's a driverless system. Honolulu is a driverless system, meaning there's no one on board to accelerate the trains, decelerate the trains, make announcements. All that's done by the control system that's on board. Um, and, and so this is a, a, a slide that shows it's based on Copenhagen, Denmark, Riyadh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Italy, Milan, Italy, Rome, Italy, Taipei, um, uh, Thessalonica, and the newer ones are actually, they're, they're all driverless systems, but it's a different technology. So if you go to the next slide, this shows the um, Honolulu Rail Project from East Kapolei into Ala Moana Center up and around uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, uh, in, in, in the various uh, uh, station stops along the way. Go to the next one. So the, the ATC, which is the Automatic Train Control, is the control system that provides the safe separation of trains. Um, it's called a driverless distance-to-go distance profile system. <clears throat> and it covers uh, the railway is uh, approximately 20 miles long. It's got a yard in the middle, 21 stations. Um, we're providing uh, 24 car trains. Uh, the control system itself is broken up into three major subsystems. There's ATP, which is Automatic Train Protection. That's the safety system. That's the one that, that I was saying before, you want to keep as simple as possible. 
but it's still a, a, a complex system and we know every f known uh, failure state that's self-detected and self-revealing and mitigated, self-mitigating. So that's automatic train protection. The automatic train operation is similar to the driver of a, of a train, similar to a driver of a car, similar to your cruise control on a car. It's a non-vital system. It, uh, its goal is to accelerate trains to speed and, and uh, decelerate trains to, in the stations. Now you'd think that that would be a, con uh, a safety system, but it's really not. The safety system's the ATP one, and it, it overrides the ATO. So if ATO does anything uh, out of tolerance with the speed, ATP will step in and take control of it and bring it back into control, and then ATO will take over again. Then the third one is ATS, Automatic Train Supervision. It's a control system that oversees the entire operation of the railway. So what's a distance to go system? The wayside ATP tells the train how fast it can go, what its target distance is, what its target speed is. So in so many feet, you have to be at this speed. It could be an acceleration, it could be a deceleration. The onboard ATP takes that information and says, okay, I need to build a profile curve to ensure that this train is at that speed at that target point. So it could be an acceleration, a deceleration, or just a continuation as is going forward. ATO is the uh, onboard uh, subsystem that actually controls the speed of the train within the supervision of ATP or the overriding capabilities of ATP. And then central control is the subsystem that monitors all of train operations and keeps trains on schedule. So if a train's running late, it can, it can take some recovery uh, actions, cause the train to accelerate out of the next station a little faster than normal, um, still within the, the, the confines of the limit that it's designed to go or to, designed to work in, or it could slow, slow trains down, uh, cause trains to stay at a station a little longer than, than what, the, what it normally does. So this diagram um, is an all-encompassing <laughs> diagram that we're not going to spend any time on other than the one in the middle at the top is central ATS and it has these control f functions off to the right and I've already gone through pretty much all of those. It, it, its main goal is to keep trains on schedule. The box in the middle and the bottom is the wayside um, component. It's made up of both vital and non-vital uh, subsystems. Its goal is to keep trains safely separated from each other from a, from a control standpoint. It doesn't really control how the trains are running. That's all up to the control system that's on board. So we've got a wayside vital and non-vital system, an onboard vital and non-vital system, and a central non-vital system. So the central has no vital capabilities at all. The two, wayside and onboard, have both non-vital functions and vital functions. So they, they, we, we divvy up the, the um, overall goals of the system and, and put them in different subsystems so we can manage the, the creation and the testing and the delivery of each of those subsystems. So the wayside architecture is made up of a micro thing, uh, our product called MicroLock. It's duplicated, meaning it's redundant. So there's, a, there's an online system and a standby system of everything. It's network connected. Uh, the Wayside uh, MicroLox talks, it um, injects a signal into the running rails that's picked up by the trains that tells the train the distance to go, the speed that it's going, um, the track circuit that it's in. We also have another subsystem where the trains communicate with um, the central office when they're at stations. The onboard architecture is, is again, made up of ATP and ATO. The, this picture at the bottom and this diagram on the side um, show the, ex, the, the specific equipment that's made up, uh, that comprises the onboard ATC architecture. It, it is under car uh, mounted, so there'll be doors on this thing, so you can't see it and it's or, you know, hermetically sealed. But it's, it's the onboard uh, control system that actually controls the train and ensures that the train behaves exactly the way that the wayside system wants it to behave. The central architecture is, again, um, duplicate servers. So that you know, the back room has, has servers where the people work and, and interface with the system are, are the uh, workstations. So the back end servers are duplicate, the networks are duplicate. So within the OCC, which is the main office control center, is a duplicate control system. 
there's also a backup control system located elsewhere that is also duplicate. So from a central control standpoint, you have to have four major failures for this, con this main central control system to be unavailable. Even if that happens, the local ATS takes over and, and makes sure that, that the trains um, are, are routed to where they're supposed to go and the system continues on, in this case, without anybody in control. And there's usually reasons why people stop it at that point. But from a design standpoint, we, we go through and, and design those things. This last diagram is, is how uh, a control system engineer looks at the railway. I said it was 20 miles long and it's got 21 stations. Well, this is what a diagram of the 21 stations and these little X's are crossovers that are controlled by these micro lock controllers. So if, if something happens at Aloha Stadium to make Aloha Stadium out of service, and just using that as, as an example, we can literally have the trains that are up in the upper portion of this turn around short of, the, of Aloha Stadium and continue to run on that portion. We can, can have the trains in the lower half do the same thing. And the only thing that's out of service is really Aloha Stadium. So uh, when you look at a driverless system that has to do all these things, it becomes uh, pretty quickly evident that it's a pretty complex system that has to deal with a lot of things. And I just picked that one location. <laughs> And this, this, any one of these stations could be out of service for any sorts of reasons. It could be a, a, a fire locally. It could be a, you know, a mudslide. It could be anything. Mm -hmm. And to take that out of service. So the, the control system has to be designed to be able to cope with that. That doesn't mean that we've got ways to get transport people you know, through the air from, from one side of the issue to the other side of what? the issue. You can't teleport? No, but, but that's, what we all, that's what we really need. Um, but that's but you kick it up several right. levels of con, of of system, and there'll be there'll be um, contingency plans in place to to have buses to show up at each of these places to Excellent. to to um, shuttle people across that need to go between those two things because we know for sure that the people that get in on it, East Capilay that wanted to go to El Moana and we can only get to El Aloha Stadium, they're not going to be so happy campers right. that they can't get there. So. If something like that happens, there's contingency plans for another control system or another uh, uh, process to be in place to shuttle people around those things. Right. These are the kinds of control systems that we've um, developed and deployed in those previous ones, Copenhagen, Brescia, Milan, Rome, um, Taipei. They're, they're all based on the same technology. They're all based on the same control system philosophy. We've improved some of the the components within them over time, um, you know, it, it, components have uh, a known life, they have obsolescence you have mm -hmm. to deal with, so you, there's natural uh, sort of events that allow you or force you to upgrade systems other than new requirements, you have to go faster, quicker, less, less volume or less energy consumption that you have to deal with as well, but, but these systems are you know, they're, they're, it's not a new system. I mean, it will be a new system, but it's not new to me. Right. I mean, we, we've lived with, with the, the system for various generations of equipment, at various um, places around the world, various different environments that it goes into. You know, one of the, one of the things here is that hey, we're on an island. Well, mm -hmm. how do you get trains to an island? Well, you build them someplace and you bring them <laughs> here, or you build them here. Right. So we're, we're building them in, in California and bringing them here. Huh. So then there's the whole logistics of trying to get that big piece of equipment here. Right. Yet, yet another sort of systems within systems Absolutely. way of thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and then how do you get it transported to where you unload it? I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's all sorts of challenges, all sorts of, of engineering activities that go along to satisfy or to support these sort of endeavors. And, and I'm just talking about train control. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's many systems that we provide that, that um, uh, for this project that have to go through the very same um, process, the very same logistics. Um, and, then, and then once it arrives here, then we go through a myriad of testing of all the conditions that we know can go wrong, that we don't know that can go wrong. And um, we're not expecting any surprises, but there's always one or two of that. And that's, that's the reason why you do all this testing, because you have to, you have to make it uh, self-evident, and you have to make it uh, uh, safe for the public to, to ride these things. Exactly, exactly. No, it's it's uh, it's it's very informative there that, that all the all the different 
layers and levels that you have to think about this on. You know? Yeah, and, it, and this, it, you know, I, I breeze through this very quickly. There, there's people that that their whole careers are are spent designing um, and testing any one portion of these subsystems, right. not the whole subsystem, right. just a portion of the right. subsystem. We got, I mean, there's experts on speed sensors. There's right. experts on, on any technology that gets placed into these, these control systems. So it, it's, uh, it, it's nothing that you build in a day. <laughs> it's nothing you build in seven days. Um, but uh, it, it can be done. We've done it many times. Um, and uh, we know how it behaves, we know what its shortcomings are, and we try to make people aware of those shortcomings, so we make sure that we minimize those and take advantage of its strengths. And its strengths are safe, safe train movement um, and, and delivering something that the public can use. And what, what I've seen around the world is that whenever these systems go into an area, you know, it's, it's very difficult for that area while during the construction. And it's very difficult while we're going through all our testing. They see the trains going back and forth. How come we can't ride them yet? Well, we, we have to go through this process. And eventually it gets opened up, and then all of a sudden these little, little um, areas of pockets of, of growth start. And, and you, you look at railways around the world, even in, in the U.S. any place, you look at where the railway goes, it, there were no people living there probably in the beginning, but they're, they're pockets of, of new uh, uh, growth and new um, environments that are, are really healthy for the, the entire population. Excellent, excellent. So that was a great overview of the, of the system. I appreciate that. We're going to have to take a little break here. Uh, you're with us on Likeable Science here. Uh, my guest in the <laughs> studio today is Tom Eichhorn from Ansaldo. I'm Ethan Allen, your host. We'll be right back. Hi, my name is Dr. Rafi. Every week, I'm right here at Think Tank Hawaii, 3 p.m. on Mondays. My show is Boris's Bio Briefings. What do we do here? Well, we watch sperm swim. We see if they catch anybody. We check out the latest biosimilars. You know, the kind that, uh, what was his name? The guy with the bicycle? Oh... Uh, I guess we forgot his name, but he was taking EPO and other human growth factors. We'll be talking about human growth factors. You want to know where to get some? Maybe I'll tell. Anyway, you can catch me, as I said, every week right here, Monday, 3 p.m., Think Tech Hawaii, Dr. Rafi. You can also find me on Twitter, BioInfo Medical. Or you can catch me on Facebook, Dr. Rafael Boritzer. I'll be happy to converse with you. Aloha. And you're back on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today in the Think Tech studios is Tom Eichhorn from Ansaldo. We're talking about systems, controls, and light rail. And we had a great discussion about overall overviews of systems and systems control early on. And then Tom just gave us a, a tremendous look through at the whole light rail system and how it's how it's all a set of systems and subsystems that all interact wonderfully. So I'd like to, to sort of step back for a moment, if I might, Tom, and uh, ask about the, the challenges in getting up. Uh, you, you, you present this beautiful picture of this smoothly functioning system and all, but, but certainly it, it hasn't, I'm sure, been totally smooth getting there. Uh, you know, it, it never is. <laughs> so what, what sorts of, of challenges have you faced? and sort of what, what are the realms of these challenges, as it were? Well, I'll just talk about the technical challenges. Okay. There, there's, there's many other challenges of you know getting bills passed through Congress and that kind of stuff. And, and I, it, I'm old enough to. I originally read about this project, I think, in 1975, and I was just a, just out of school. And I thought, boy, that'd be a, that'd be a nice project to work on someday. <laughs> uh, so you, you know, <laughs> nearly 40 years later, here I am. Um, so the, the, the technical challenges. Uh, that are somewhat unique to Honolulu, but not, not really, really unique to Honolulu, are, are keeping up with, um, like I said before, we have to, the, the, a control si the control systems that we build, we need to know what the speed limits are for each curve, each grade, each, each um, uh, station to go through, each interlocking to go through. So we have to build control tables and, and make sure that, that, that we have all those speeds correct and, and, and and, and within our design. So the, one of the technical challenges here is, is that um, we, have, we have various system level requirements. One of them is we're required to do a round trip in 90 minutes. 
from mm -hmm. East Capilla to Ala Moana, Ala Moana back to East Capilla in 90 minutes. So that seems like a very, very well-defined requirement. So mm -hmm. it, you know, it's 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 simple, it's measurable, it's all those you know smart right. rules of requirements. However, you know then 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 you get the wrinkle of yeah, but we can't build this this viaduct to go this way. We have to go that way, and that way introduces a few more curves, and this way goes another few more curves, and we create a hill here and a grade there. And so the challenge is is to is to is to continue to make the control system able to deal with not not just deal with those things, but try to not try to but to meet the overall goal of ninety minute round trip time. And and so the the while the, the the changing of the grades and the curves is pretty much out of our control, we still have to say, yes, we can still do that. So mm -hmm. we have simulations that we run that, that model the, the railway itself. So we build all the grades and the curves and the, and the train performance into these things. And so it's a, it's a real challenge to be able to continue to meet this top level simple goal mm -hmm. when the underlying railway goes through some changes. I'm not saying they're major changes, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take a lot of, you know, or a lot of change to affect the round trip time. So that that's been one of the 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 the, the goal, the the challenges here. To be honest with you, it's a challenge on all the systems because mm -hmm. everybody, um, you know, the, the the nobody makes the goals easy, <laughs> or they wouldn't be goals. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, they, yeah, exactly. So they're they're always challenges, and the people that that, that write their specs, they know how. Well, you know how long it takes to go from point A to point B and back again. So they say, well, it could be if we made it 110 seconds, no problem. Right. So that, those are those are just a you know one of the one of the challenges is to try to address those. Sure. So you, you want to make this uh, set these overall goals where the public will actually use this. They'll find it to be a, a, an exactly. attractive option. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. You know, so right. if it. You know, if if it takes you an hour and twenty minutes to come in from East Capilla into right. Center City, you know, this will be an attractive option because right. you can do it much much quicker than that. Um, but so that was that was like the, one of the the, the um, fundamental goals of of the project that we'd be able to do right. that, even though we have to deal with other things that are pretty much out of our control. We have to be able to to deal with that. So we we try to make the, the you know the the, the impact of the grades or the curves as minimal as possible. Well, it'd be good if we could just lower this by a percentage or two and then we can you know, make this happen. Um, but, but those are all the, the same kind of things. Another, another challenge is we, we are on an island. Um, we are in a, a seismic zone that's certainly not as, as unstable as other areas of the world. Um, mm -hmm. You can just think of a lot of other places that way, right. even the, the big islands, much, much um, more seismic event driven than, than we are here on Oahu, um, but but we have we have uh, seismic detectors. So if, if any of those go off, we we have a, a, a strategy that um, comes into play and we effectively stop trains pretty much wherever they are as quickly as we can because we don't know what the what the next event's going to be. We just right. know that one of these seismic. So that was that's a first for us to actually build seismic detectors into our control system. Uh -huh. They've been in other control systems, like in Los Angeles, and the people in control center will stop the trains. But this is this is our first one where we've we've actually built that into the control system, and it's an automatic reaction to another event. So those are those are some of the uh, uh, you know, it's a couple of the technical challenges that Honolulu brings to that we haven't sure. had to address before. And, and have you yet? Have you sort of had to face? New challenges that you didn't sort of count on when you were when you first got got the project. Um, yeah, I suppose there's a few challenges that that come up. Um, uh, certainly, the you know, I, well, the, the, some of the things that we knew that that were going to be challenges. You know, that that one there's there's no rail transit agency on Oahu, so that had to grow up and and become stable all by itself. Um, and there's no um, uh, skill set on island that is used to building these kind of systems mm -hmm. or that we're used to, uh, that have built these things before. So those, those were kind of knowns coming in. Okay. Um, and you know, some of the unknowns, um, there, there, there wasn't a lot of, of unknowns going in, but there's always the, there's, you know, this the whole thing of what you, didn't, you know you don't know. Exactly. And and the the only thing that we have to to rely on there is experience. You know, we, we know what these systems do. We we know how they behave. 
Um, if some new event gets introduced that hasn't been introduced before, we've got a pretty good idea how it's going to uh, how it's going to work. Or, uh, it, and if if we don't, the 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 subset of possible reactions is is reduced based on how many times we've done this before mm -hmm. and how many times we've reused the same um, design of a system before. So there, you know, there's not so many. Um, oh my goodness! Here's a, a challenge. Have, had we not had a driverless system before, sure, right. um, uh, we could. I can recall back to our first driverless system. There was many. Oh yes, yes I mean the, the 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 no, you don't know thing was gigantic on that system. Right. I mean it was it was it was very large. And here, here you've run into many of the contingencies already. You, you've you've seen that the, we, the ways these systems can exactly we've seen face all glitches and we've 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 seen pretty much. Um, I mean, we built the, the effectively we built the system five and six times mm -hmm. before now. Excellent. So um, the, well, I'm not at all suggesting that we know everything that's going to happen because mm -hmm. we know we don't. Sure. Well, I, that, mean, that, I mean, all of our training tells us we don't. Sure, sure. Um, but we, we also know that we have to deal with it, and we also know that um, it's more than likely we've dealt with it already. Whether the people on this project have dealt with it, Somebody in our organization has dealt with it, and, right. and uh, through new technologies, it's easy to get a hold of those people. Right, and the, and the systems you put in place, and the controls, and the backup controls, even if a new challenge pops up, hopefully, you know, all your systems will. Yeah. So be it, one, in place to deal one with thing it. that I didn't say was I, I did say that the wayside was a duplicate system, and, and it, it's true. The wayside micro locks are duplicate. The track circuits themselves are duplicate. The onboard system is fully duplicate. So uh, you know you can have a you know a catastrophic failure of one subsystem or one system on board, and it switches over to the other one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the same, like I said, I explained the the, the office one is actually f uh, quadruple. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that it, they'll never fail and never stop. Right. That just means that the likelihood. Right. Uh, we're trying to always increase availability. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a fundamentally a numbers game, and all you it can is. ever do is, is push the odds of exactly. total failure down as low as you can feasibly exactly. make them. Right. Well, and and stay within budget right. and right. stay you know sure. beat the competition on what they bid. Right. Well, well, there's yeah. always those things. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as, as more and more of these as technology, you've, you've automated more and more things now. We got got rid of the drivers and you know yeah. all these pesky little human interactions. Where do you see this going? I mean, sort of what, where is this going to, where, how, how much of this is going to become non-human entirely? Well, it, it, I mean, it's never going to be non-human because the industry is, the fundamental thing is, the, one of the other fundamental requirements is we have to move 7,200 people per hour per direction. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we're always trying to move people. So mm -hmm. people aren't going to disappear out of the thing. We've gotten this system, uh, we have built other systems that are not driverless, but mm -hmm. this system is a driverless system, so you don't have drivers. Um, the, the, the ticket takers and that kind of things are, are pretty much um, automated as well. Um, the, the, there's not much more we can do from a control standpoint to automate it because there really isn't anybody. But you could make, I mean, the, the future of computers, the future of networks are, are you know, in the adaptive, uh, self-healing nature of, of components. Mm -hmm. And certainly those can be uh, increase your reliability, increase your availability without duplicating the whole system. You know, the duplicating systems is, is pretty much the brute force method of, of making something available, more, more available. So technology can bring a lot to it. Um, uh, like I said, self-healing. Uh, people are always going to be around to, to set different goals, to expand systems, to say, you know, a, a control system is never going to say, I think I need to branch out to Waikiki. <laughs> I mean, they, they're not going to do that. But people do that. Right. So people are always going to be in the loop right. uh, of these type systems. Um, and, and, and once you scratch the surface, even these health, self-healing, uh, um, futuristic systems, there's, there's just there's code in there that somebody wrote to, to allow it to adapt, to, mm -hmm. to allow it to morph into something different, mm -hmm. but still within the, the, the design constraints of, of the overall um, system. So I, I don't see it uh, uh, evolving very much, but, but we do have different technologies that are used. So you know, this is a, a set of technologies that we, that we have. There's another set of technologies that, you know, it's a totally different control concept that, you know, we've deployed and have several um, in, in operation. 
they still move people. They mm-hmm. still they, they they still are are uh, constrained by uh, you know if we have steel wheels on steel rails, you can only accelerate and decelerate so fast. Mm-hmm. You could put tires on them. You could put them on concrete. We've done that. Mm-hmm. They accelerate better. They decelerate better. They get flat tires. They, they, you know, they, they, they just have other issues that 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 system has to deal with. So, you know, and and we've worked on uh, uh, magnetic levitation. Those are those are really kind of cool and techy, uh-huh. real techy. Um, you know, linear motors for accelerations. They have all kinds of good things, but they're really. Uh, a challenge to maintain, to, to, to keep in tolerance. Uh, you know, there's potentials that for, for those kind of things. And you look at um, uh, other other concepts of, of um, tubes and people in tubes mm-hmm. and flying through, and they all have merit. Right. They all have merit. They they all have. But the, the 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 thing that will hold some of it and it's held back all all safety systems is the certification of making them safe, making sure. them. Making it safe for the public to use, and and that's one of the the challenges with introducing new technology because the new technology itself has to be stable. Exactly. You know, exactly. to 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 have self-revealing new technology. New technology is great for doing some amazing things, but it's not necessarily built to be self-revealing of when it's not doing those things the way you want it to do. Right. Indeed, indeed. Well, this, is, this has been fascinating, Tom. This has been a very informative, uh, enlightening, entertaining, educational for me. Uh, it's been wonderful to, to talk with you here about, about systems, controls, and light rail. Uh, we're wrapping it up here on Likeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. My guest today has been Tom Eichhorn from Ansaldo. And thank you very much for being here, well, Tom. Thanks for inviting me, Ethan. It was fun. Aloha. Yeah, aloha. <laughs>